Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFirio, and I'm your host for the show. Thank you so much for taking the time to tune in today. And if it's your first time to the show or you've been listening for a long time, I really would be happy if you would subscribe to the show. It's a great way to stay updated with all of the episodes that come out, all the content. It helps the show out as well. It helps me know who's listening, you know, around the world. We have a lot of people listening in over 170 some odd countries. So and I'm glad you're one of them. So go ahead and subscribe to Keys to the Shop. And also don't forget to share these episodes. That's a great way to help the show grow. And if you love what Keys to the Shop does, leave a five-star review over on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify. And if you're not aware, you can listen to Keys to the Shop on Spotify as well. So thanks, everybody. Now, you know, Keys to the Shop is not just a podcast, but also a consulting and coaching company. This is something as a service that uh, is born from Keys to the Shop. As I started to do the show, I realized, you know, there's a, a lot of things that I would love to be able to help people with one-on-one. -on -one. Keys to the Shop Consulting was born and it has been so fantastic to help so many people in the past few years here. I would love to be able to help you as well. And specifically, Keys to the Shop Consulting works with owners and operators who want to build something that is sustainable, excellent, and fulfilling. Finding your operations, your people, and your quality is the step to do that. So whether you're just getting started in coffee or you already have a coffee shop and, and roastery, but you want to address very specific issues that you're having related to performance or related to scaling your business, or you just want to get an assessment for how you're doing right now and how you can generally get to the next level. This is what I've helped many people with over the years, and I'd love to have a conversation and see how I can help you. All you need to do is email me. Chris at keys to the shop.com is where you can reach out. We'll set up a free discovery call one-on-one. -on -one. We'll talk about where you're at with your business and how I might be able to help you with coaching and consulting. Again, that email for keys to the shop consulting, Chris at keys to the shop. Dot com. It's so exciting to be able to work in an industry where people are excited about the product. Uh, coffee is, you know, we, there's a lot of caffeine in coffee. And so we are excitable, us coffee people. But, you know, we are also very innovative. And the innovations that are born in our community are there to help improve the processes and improve the coffee quality. One of these companies that is just an absolute juggernaut and innovator in this space is Ground Control. The Ground Control Cyclops Brewer from Voga Coffee has been revolutionizing batch brew coffee for years now. The SCA award-winning technology allows you to extract an incredible range of flavors and a depth of flavor that you were previously not able to do with traditional batch brewers. And it also makes tea, batch diced lattes, batch cold brew. So the extraction possibilities are incredible. Check them out at groundcontrol.coffee. They're just introduced their new brewer. It's a smaller footprint. It's just amazing in terms of design. Same functionality, a little bit more compact. The price is a little bit lower. And you know, I think it's just a worthy investment for your cafe. If you want to increase your efficiency and workflow and open up new channels of profitability, the ground control is something you should definitely look at. Again, check them out over at groundcontrol.coffee. You know, companies are either going to sell you something and be done with it, or they're going to create something and support you in the use of their product along the way. Now, the latter example of support and creation and collaboration is the epitome of what Pacific is known for. The Barista Series from Pacific is a line of plant-based performance beverages that is designed for the barista community and tested by that community before their products get launched. So you know that it stands up to the heat from steaming. It has amazing texture for latte art, and it keeps the balance of the beverage focused on the coffee. This is their passion. Their passion is to work with passionate coffee people to make a consistently great product and support each other along the way. I really recommend them. Go to pacificfoodservice.com to get samples in your store today and try it for yourself. I really think if you're looking for the best plant-based beverages to serve your customers, you need to be using the Barista Series from Pacific. 
Okay, everybody. Well, today is a day where we talk about coffee quality. Now, one of the things on this show that we do often is we talk about management and operations and leadership and subjects around that in the cafe. And when we talk with people who come on the show, we also talk about their areas of expertise related to roasting science and operations. And we talk about coffee with champions and scientists, etc. Now, I want to give you some of the things that I have implemented in places where I've been responsible as a trainer or as a consultant and give you some ideas of how you can improve the coffee quality of of your bar. Now, the reason why this is really important is because it is easy for us to become just blinded to the areas of improvement in our coffee bar simply by familiarity. Just for the fact that we're always there, we're just in the day in and day out. It's just like that part of your cafe that always you see that there's cobwebs there. It's that one part where you just kind of walk by it and you end up walking by it for like two years and you never do anything about it. And the customers just see it, but they don't think anything of it. But why is nobody ever cleaning that one corner? You might be thinking that, yeah, that's me. That's like that one part of our, our foyer or whatever. This is a perfect example of just how we can become used to certain things. And therefore, we don't imagine that there's any other way to approach it, except for the way that we've approached it thus far. That's where, you know, coaching and consulting comes in, actually, and the community where you can go out and see another coffee bar doing it differently. And it gives you some ideas. Technically, could you have had that idea yourself? Well, of course, you're a human being just like them, I think. <laughs> and you could have had that idea. They had that idea. And this is why community is so important, because you can come at the same problem from different angles and different backgrounds. And that diversity of thought helps us create a more resilient industry. But we can't get there unless we're willing to constantly look at our coffee bar from a new perspective and be willing to admit that maybe there's some room for improvement. And a lot of the things that I end up hearing is that there is a problem with getting customers into the cafe. And if they would just get into the cafe, if we just get people into the cafe, then everything would be fine. But that's not necessarily the case because once they're in your cafe, they'll taste your coffee and they'll taste your product and they will vote with their dollars slowly but surely, either more in your direction or less. And if you've ever seen that meme of Homer Simpson backing up slowly into a bush and disappearing, that is exactly the way it feels to be a customer who has given a chance to a coffee bar who was staffed by lovely people, who was staffed by you know people with a great cause, but just for the life of them cannot seem to produce a coffee that doesn't taste a little off, just a little weird. There's a problem here or there. And it's like, you know, I can put up with it for so long. You know, I, uh, I played clarinet when I was in elementary school and my aunts and uncles were treated, quote unquote, treated to recitals of us kids, my sisters on the flute and me on a clarinet, sounding like a bunch of birds that were being, you know, <laughs> interrogated for information, I'm sure. Yeah, maybe I'm being a little hard on us, but the point is, is that there's only so much of that they can take before they're like, I'm going to look to the professionals <laughs> when it comes to playing music that I want to hear later on. So a lot of independent coffee shops will get to this point where they've got their stuff set up and they're just like, mm, we're so passionate. We're just got the, the new machine. We've got a new logo, just came, came back from Fiverr. We leafleted, we pamphleted, we got everybody coming in and our friends and family night was really awesome. And I'm really feeling good about the future. And then all of a sudden it's crickets. And yes, there might be some, you know, marketing issues. It might be a location issue. What we don't often think about is that maybe what we're making is not good. Maybe people don't like the taste of the things that we're creating. And we don't think that way because we feel ill-equipped to make a change to those things. And so because we know intuitively 
it took us so much just to get to this point in our coffee quality that, you know, if somebody says no to it, we're tempted to either ignore that or not even consider it and think it's something else, or we're just going to dismiss it with the idea that they're just not our customers. We just want people that like the way we are, the way we are, not that we can improve these things because we've got so much sunk cost into this. Maybe you hired a trainer that came and told you to do this, that, and the other thing. Even if a professional trainer comes to you and has good ideas and starts you off in the right direction, that doesn't mean it's gonna be the direction you should be going in forever and ever. You need to consider all of your options when it comes to making your coffee quality, the quality of what you produce on your bar, the best that it can be. And even though it might feel uncomfortable and you might not know how to do it, you need to th consider that some of the reason you might not have as much business as you want is because you're not as good as you can be and that your coffee doesn't taste the way you think it tastes. And the competitor might come in and they don't have such sunk cost. They just start from scratch and they might be a frustrated customer of yours. And then they start up and then everyone gets all up in arms. They're like, they're doing the same menu items we are and all this other stuff. So instead of thinking, well, why are people going there to begin with? Maybe their coffee is better. Maybe their milk is more consistent. And it could be something beyond the quality, like it could be hospitality and the consistency of your hospitality. But let's just embrace the idea that wherever you are in the moment, you can refine the way that your coffee tastes, the way that your beverages are presented in the way that they're, they taste. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to dive right into this subject that is uncomfortable. And I want to give you some advice and five ways that I think that you can improve your coffee quality to maybe eliminate one of these possibilities so that you can end up with, you know, narrowing it down and saying, well, you know, maybe it's not the coffee quality because we are doing these things and we are constantly refining it. And maybe it is the marketing and you can be a little bit more assured that if you do get people in the door, that you're actually going to be prepared for them. Just like if you have a skeleton crew and you get a busload of customers, you're not going to be prepared for that success. Like your marketing success could be your operational failure. So let's dive into this. The first thing that I think that we need to do in terms of improving your coffee quality is consider the resting time and age of your coffee. We've had one episode of Rate of Rise that was with Joey Stazone of Cafe Creole. And that was talking about ideal resting times for coffee. And I know that this sounds like a very small thing, but as a barista for decades, I will tell you that coffee quality and ideal resting times for espresso specifically is a make or break issue for consistency in your coffee. People will create charts to age avocados perfectly in order to get the right kind of you know guacamole. But we will just open any bag of coffee. We'll take any coffee. We'll put it in the hopper and we'll just brew it and be like, wow, the coffee's acting weird today. And nobody is tracking that age. Nobody is writing down the way a roaster has between batch protocols, how are you gaining information about what your coffee is doing on day two, three, four, five? I mean, honestly, with espresso, I would recommend you don't even touch that bag of coffee until it's at least, let's just say a week old. And at that point, even I would suggest cut the bag open, like open it, the night before, let it air out and then put it in your hopper. And then at least you have a more stable coffee because the CO2 produced from roasting will not interfere in the extraction process as much. There's a lot of turbulence that happens in the puck of coffee during the brewing process, similar to a bloom of coffee. And we have a upcoming episode with a uh, scientist, Samo Smirky, who is going to go in detail about this specifically for espresso and aging coffee. So this is uh, on my mind lately, but frankly, I can't believe 
two things. One, how fresh some of your coffee is. It's so gassy, it gives me gas. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's horrible to work with, but we have no choice. Inventory was mismanaged. Now, there might be some kind of benevolent reason why we have to use a fresh bag of coffee. It may just be because we're so much more successful than we thought. Everyone's so lovingly going to our coffee shop. We didn't anticipate this. Gosh, what a good problem to have. That should happen once, maybe twice. At that point, you should have at least pivoted your inventory to account for the potential of having that kind of business again, right? Never waste a problem, like we've said. Problems are there to help you innovate solutions to not repeat the same problems in the future. So with Coffee Age, you need to have enough coffee in your coffee bar that will allow you to age your espresso appropriately for what that coffee performs best at. You could go through a whole five pound bag of coffee multiple times in the same in one day, depending on how busy you are. So this might be a space issue for you. I understand that. But if you're going to prioritize storage space for anything in your coffee shop, I think it needs to be, lo and behold, for the coffee and specifically for your espresso. So that was one, freshness of coffee, the foamy, sour, weird, oh, just like all over the place, gushing from the spouse. It starts off slow, and then all of a sudden it just like gets like this, these, these fat streams of coffee, and it just tastes like grapefruit pith and defeat. So then there's the other extreme, which is we have coffee in the hopper that is so old because our coffee bar is not as, you know, busy as we'd like it to be. And that's a real problem because we don't want to waste money, but we ordered too much coffee. This is an inventory issue again. So we have to pay very close attention to this to make sure our espresso is its ideal age and it's not too fresh, but it's also not too old that it just has nothing left to give. It's just stale and flat. It just, you can tell when you have really old coffee, because when I was in a mode of tasting espresso at every coffee bar I went to in upstate New York, I would go to all these college coffee bars and all of these espresso shops back in the early 2000s, because I was just obsessed with coffee. I was like a new coffee geek. And I punished my palate so much. Owners not wanting to waste inventory would keep coffee in there. And admittedly, I was also a very, it was a very dark roast, but it was old. You know why I could tell? Because it was fast and it was fast because it had no oils. It had none of the stuff in it to hold the water back, to bind the puck together, to resist the water flow, which means it was going to be super hot because there's no dissipation of heat. There's no opportunity for the water to hit this, what is essentially to the water, like an ice cube, room temperature ice cube of, of coffee that cools the water down. So these hot espresso shots are from fast shots that are the result of stale, lifeless coffee. This is why condiment bars were invented. <laughs> Bad quality coffee. Why do you think there are walls, literal walls of syrups in coffee bars around the world. It's not because that's an art form. It's often to make up for the flavor of the coffee. And so let's think about the age of our coffee and become students of it. Take responsibility. Even if your roaster can't tell you exactly, you're using enough coffee that you can track it to figure out where the best range of days are for you, for that coffee. And then make your inventory produce bags of coffee that are always within that window so your baristas can always be using it. So the other thing I would say is decaf. Decaf coffee gets a bad rap. Now, I don't think that today we have any excuse not to have wonderful decaffeinated coffee in our coffee bars. There are so many options for process in decaf processes. And so many roasters are embracing high quality decaf coffees. You have options. So no longer is it or should it be relegated to the, the shame. Like it always going to be a smaller grinder because it's less demand. But I don't have a problem with you. If you're going to get like a Malkunig E80, why not have an E80 for decaf? Now, here's the thing. 
we have to first deal with our deep seated, uh, you know, cert we have to first deal with our deep seated issues with decaf if we want to approach this with any kind of professional integrity. But decaf has an age window as well. And because decaf is inevitably and you know, it is processed in such a way that the cellular structure of the coffee is more brittle, it breaks down faster, ages faster. The best decaf coffee comes from small hoppers. And actually, if you were going to default to something a little bit more fresh, it would be your decaf coffee because of that hyper aging of the coffee, the accelerated aging process of the coffee as decaf. Once the decaf, in my opinion, this is just my experience, after about a week, it really starts to go downhill. This is both in terms of decaf on drip or decaf on pour over, but especially decaf in your hopper. So lower quantities and higher rotation of stock and inventory for decaf would be my ideal. Oh, how glorious. If I knew that there was some kind of like a scientifically optimized rotation of decaf in these coffee bars, but most times when I come in and I order and I do a decaf espresso, it's just, oh my gosh. Oh no, hold on. It's an extra five minutes, at least <laughs> most of the time. There are some people that are better at it than others, but we have a ways to go there. So please, 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 across the board, whether it's single origin, whether it's your espresso blend, regular or decaf, optimize the age of your coffee. So that's the first thing. The second is kind of an extension of this, and it has to do with tracking the performance of a coffee. And it's not just related to age, it's also performance of a coffee related to how your customers respond to the coffee. Not just taking, you know, coffees and saying, well, we like this a lot and we're just gonna put this on the bar. And, you know, you can blame market forces all you want, but sometimes the decisions that we make about what we serve are self-serving. And you have to play ball a little bit I and mean, you have to pay attention to what your customers love. And yes, there is an educational process. It's not even educational. It's exploration on the behalf of the customer to expose them to something that they may in fact like. Now, how would that happen? That would happen if you knew that there was some kind of a connecting thread. How would I know, for instance, that my wife might like something? as a present, you know, Mother's Day is coming up. So got to think about this. How would I know that? Well, my knowledge of her is going to help me figure out something that she might like. Now, how your coffee performs on the bar with your customers feedback will allow you to make better choices for what you bring in from your roaster, or if you're a roaster, what you bring in in terms of what's available in the market. If your customers historically have hated, just hated anaerobic process coffees that taste like these, these, these fruit bombs and funky coffees, they hate it, oh my gosh, but we love it so much. Will we doggedly just keep pursuing it? and then kind of play victim and say, oh, oh, you know, people aren't buying this coffee. We can't, we can't do that. We have to track a coffee's performance across all of its different iterations, whether it's being sold on the bar as a beverage, as a single origin espresso, as a pour over or a drip, you know, you, or it's being sold on the shelf. You got to track these things and allow your decisions to be informed by what your customers are telling you through their purchasing habits. And if you, again, take a page from the playbook of roasters, good roasters, if we're learning anything from the Rate of Rise series, which is a lot, it's that between batch protocols are very important. And when it comes to how a coffee performs on bar, I think that this is equally important for a cafe that you're tracking that. And another aspect of tracking a coffee's performance, we come from a different angle here, is actually paying attention to how it's being brewed consistently on the bar. 
the pour overs are kind of a mystery. Uh, we don't know exactly if we're getting the kind of extraction that we need from that coffee. In fact, most coffee bars that have pour over bars would do well to get rid of their pour over bar if they're not going to invest in a lot of training and accountability and use of technology, frankly, to determine that the ideal throw weights, the proper throw weights are achieved, you know, bloom times, water temperatures, extraction yield, and that kind of thing. This is what batch brewers are really good at. I mean, we've had a couple of episodes a little while back with Ryan Soder about batch brew versus pour overs. And, you know, both can be very good, but a lot of times the best that you can hope for as a pour over barista is to be as good as a batch brewer. And so there's a lot to talk about there. But the point is, is that we do have technology at our disposal to help us with that. You can use a connected Akaya scale to connect you with what's happening in your coffee bars throughout the day to see where batches have, where pour overs are. You can test your coffees throughout the day to determine how your batch brew is performing. There's lots of different tools to test the TDS, the extraction percentage. You could do this for espresso as well. And if you don't have a trainer, you can just train your manager to do this on a regular basis. Do it on a weekly basis or a randomized selection of coffees throughout the week, maybe not on the same day, maybe sometimes during the close, sometimes during the open. And if you have multiple cafes, you can track the performance of your coffees digitally through things like Cropster Cafe, which I'm just learning a little bit about now. It's worth exploring as sort of like the, again, like, well, it's the Cropster of cafes. That's why it's called what it's called. But Cropster is how you track the performance of a coffee in the drum of a coffee or the chamber of a roaster. And this is how you would track the performance of a coffee across your bars. Now you can use that or you can just use good old fashioned paper and pen if you want. But the fact that we don't see this as much, we don't see the tracking of the performance of coffee, both in how customers are responding to it and how we're actually preparing it, says a lot. Really, it just says that we're super sloppy with the way that we present coffee. For all the technological ability we have, we still just kind of shoot from the hip when it comes to this kind of thing. And that's not going to work very well. So that's something you can do to improve your coffee quality right away is just start tracking the performance of your coffee. Now, tracking with that is the idea of continued education and training for your staff. This is part of why people don't like going to coffee bars. And it's part of the reason why we tend to submarine people's experiences when they walk into a specialty coffee shop. We build their expectations so high. Oh my gosh, we're so good. We hire photographers, we've got filters, we put it on Instagram. It's this utopia of coffee. And then they come in and it's just that he does <laughs> the wish.com version of what we explained we are in our marketing copy and our images. Part of this is consistency. Like one day, you know, somebody will come in and they'll get a great cappuccino. They'll tell their friends, they'll come in. And all of a sudden that person is stuck trying to kind of tell their friends, oh yeah, sorry, usually they're so good. I'm not sure what, might be, it just be an off day today. And now you make them look like a fool <laughs> because they were advocating for you and you've made them regret it, okay? We can't put people in that position. If people get a great drink from us and they go and sing our praises, let's make them look good, like they know what they're talking about, okay? They are planting seeds out there for us and we have control of whether or not we're going to live up to those expectations. You know, if I bring back friends to your coffee bar and that cappuccino was a fluke, I know that either you have one good barista on staff who can't work all day, every day, unfortunately. You know, this is where we get the advent of, you know, having our favorite barista because they, they make it better than the others. Horrible. What a curse. Which reminds me, The Curse of the Favorite Barista is also an episode that we've done. You should listen to that too. It shows me there's a lot of room for improvement when it comes to processes and that you probably onboarded your people super fast, gave them minimal training, didn't want them to be on the clock without producing money for you. So you just 
pushed it. You got them on the bar. You used excuses like, oh, sink or swim, trial by fire, and all this fun stuff that we like to think is legitimate jargon, which basically is just us being irresponsible. And then all of a sudden, we get inconsistency and we're like, oh, man, I don't know why people you know, don't like our coffee. And no, I know why. It, because it's not good. It's not as good as it could be because we're not really investing into it past the initial establishment of our business or the onboarding of our baristas. We're not really helping people develop their skills and come to maturation. Like we need to help people grow into becoming consistent. Technology is at such a point now where this should be very easy to do. We've got scales in the drip trays. We've got flow meters and, and automatic espresso machines. We've got puck presses. And for the life of me, still, we don't get consistency in the coffee because there's still user error. And if you don't like the idea of being replaced with a super automatic espresso machine, which can actually these days produce really good quality coffee, then we got to get on this. I think, and I advocate for the human experience. You know, we need that. Super automatic espresso machines are seeing a rise partly because we just can't stop making machines. Partly also because we know that people will disappoint us. We really time and tend to train them. And it's partly because we just don't have an approach from the beginning that that is a necessary investment. And so any further investment past the initial investment seems like a real drag. And it seems like this thing that we just want to avoid at all costs. And we end up saying, oh, it's hard to find good people. It's actually hard to find good operators. You know, that's just as true, even though you don't have as much of a sample size as you do with staff, it's really difficult uh, out there. You know, it's easy to start a coffee bar, hard to count the cost, hard to enter into it with the idea that we're going to improve over time. We just want to get it right the first time and kind of set it and forget it. So continued training is absolutely necessary. I like to say at this point, you know, do you know exactly how good your staff are at particular menu items? If I just pointed to a menu item and then I pointed to a barista and I said, how do they make that? You should be able to tell me. This is your craft. This is your trade. You should be able to tell me like how good this person is at making an Americano or a, a skinny latte or a macchiato, traditional or Starbucks, <laughs> it doesn't matter. That's the kind of knowledge that you can really say gives you expertise and ultimately gives you the power to be able to have comfort in knowing and sleeping well at night, knowing that your business is in good hands or that you have work to do in certain areas. Most bars just don't know this. And so they don't want to open up that box. They want to pull a fridge out and see what's behind it. And so we need to do that. We need to say, look, it's very likely that people are underfilling drinks. People are overfilling drinks. People are over extracting things or they are over steaming their milk, over foaming, and thus, you know, creating a more of a liquid concentration in a beverage. The flavor balance of your beverage will be either realized or damaged by the accuracy of the performance of your staff. And that's something that you can help through continued education and training and consistency. And you need to know this stuff. You need to go on a campaign, not as a mission to try to investigate because you think people are screwing you over. If this is the case and you can't tell me how people are performing on your bar the way that I just described, that's on you. That's not on them. That's a operational issue. You know, far be it from me to be telling you to go in there like, you know, y'all need to be stepping it up because it looks like your coffee quality is not what it should be. And, you know, go online and, you know, learn some stuff about latte art and go look at these YouTube videos. No, no, this is something where we need to sort of create an institution in our business to bring everybody to the same level of excellence. And then as a team, improve that level as we go. Do you have an hour to give to your staff 
one hour per staff member per month of continued education. Start there. For those of you who are building coffee bars, build that into the cost of operations. Those of you who have not built that in, I know it's a big thing to consider, but really and truly, the investment into your people, I say investment, it's not a cost. It's not a cost. Actually, it is an investment because they represent your brand to the people. Again, back to what I started with, they represent the trust that your customers place in your cappuccinos, in your mochas, in your lavender ice lattes. And if they tell their friends and they come in and they all experience the same level of quality, it's only because you designed it that way. And if it's consistent, that consistency comes from highly trained and continually trained and invested into teams of professionals. That's what we're after here. And that's another way to improve your coffee quality. The fourth thing that we need to focus on here is tasting all your drinks. I mentioned this in a shift break a while ago called Taste the Rainbow. And I'm gonna reiterate it here because it's very important that you understand today how all of your beverages taste. Now, if you're gonna train your people to do well, you need to be tasting the coffee. That's how you know how good people are. I know that you personally may not drink that particular drink, but if it's on your menu and you haven't tasted it for the last three or four months, it's probably time to take a sample. We're really good at cupping. We wanna cup all these coffees. It looks very professional. We imagine ourselves, you know, being being quite bespoke in our cupping labs. But really, the most effective cupping comes from to-go cups. I know that's really difficult to imagine, but if you're not tasting your caramel lattes the way that you're tasting your Panama Geshas, then you're missing something because this is the stock and trade of coffee bars. You're serving a menu. You have to be experts in that menu. You have to be up to date taste-wise with how these coffees that legitimately you should be cupping taste coming out of the batch brewer, the espresso machine, milk drinks, all of the iterations. How are we even tracking that? We have to be. So we have to taste it. It's not just technology or numbers. It's actually interacting with it. So get people to make you the menu. I don't know what the right rhythm is for you. I would say quarterly. Let's just start there. On a quarterly basis, you need to go through your menu and taste it. How is it tasting? Sample this stuff. And I mean like a full beverage. Take it in your hand the way a customer would. Go out there and order a dirty iced chai. And you don't have to drink the whole thing. But drink it and make notes. Who out there, I would love to know this, by the way, if you do this, you're my hero. <laughs> I, please, please tell me if you do this. Do you have a cupping log for your menu that you keep on a regular basis? I know we do for a cupping coffees. I know there's a lot on the line. You want to make a bad investment, right? But we should have cupping logs for our menu too. So somebody out there can invent that if it's not a thing, but this would be a great way for you to improve the quality because it exposes you to the reality of your bar. It won't always be the same as it was when you first opened. Hopefully it'll be better. But sometimes you're like, how did we start making it this way? Oh, it just kind of evolved. The baristas had to make decisions and maybe they chose some direction that you didn't like. Now you have the chance to correct it right? But if you're not interacting with your beverages, you don't know how good you are. You actually don't know how bad you are either. That's worrisome. So taste all of your drinks. Now, the final thing I'm going to say here, number five, is that you need to practice cleanliness and communication. Now, cleanliness, of course, in my mind, is how you keep a clean mind, is how you keep your sanity during a rush. I like to think about it as every order gets a cleaning tax. Three seconds, just three seconds. One, two, three. 
I'm doing something to clean and prep, maybe longer. But the idea is that I cannot work very well. I can't be consistent. I can't practice excellence when it is chaos, when there's coffee grounds everywhere and I just can't function. Maybe this is just me, but even if you feel comfortable around chaos, it doesn't make it just your style. Universally, when a customer walks into a dirty environment that's disorderly, whether you personally as a barista feel comfortable is irrelevant. They will perceive it as being, oh, something happened. Something is happening. I'm in the middle of what appears to be a unprofessional environment. And this doesn't really bode well. Now, no one's actually articulating this in the moment, but it's just a tick in the box next to, hmm, something to think about. And we don't want to give people too many of those opportunities to tick that box in the direction of doubt. Okay. And functionally speaking, I think it's better to have a clean bar than it is to have a dirty one. Even just thinking about the fact that you will lose track of drinks, drinks will become dirty, ceramics will become smudged, bottoms of cups will be placed in pools of water mixed with coffee grounds, milk will go bad. You're going to have more to do at the end of the day, at the end of your shift, and you're going to feel like, you know, even though it maybe wasn't as busy as it was the day before, if it's a dirty bar with less business, feels busier than a clean bar with more business. This is the way I believe that it is. Yeah. So cleanliness and working clean is critical to having a smooth operation, to keeping your wits about you, to setting a good precedent for what the customer sees. They know you've got it together and you feel like you've got it together. And if you train your people to work clean, it improves the quality because it makes people practice awareness of their surroundings. And awareness is the gift that keeps giving. I'm aware of the espresso and how it's pulling. I'm aware of the sound of the milk. I'm aware of the order being taken that I can start on right now so I can save some time. You practice awareness. Maybe it starts with cleanliness. It's just one area, but I believe that it overlaps into other areas. Now, communication, once you have that awareness, is the next step here. I mean, that communication allows you to practice consistency accuracy too, by the way, accuracy in that you may have missed that somebody at the last minute, you remember that drink that I said was being prepped ahead of time because you wanted to save time? Well, because you're so busy with that and you weren't aware of it, that person changed it to almond milk. Now, that communication needs to happen between POS and the person prepping the drink. Now, that can only happen if I dedicate myself to always talking and communicating and over communicating. I don't really want you to assume that I heard you. If I'm working on bar, I need a heard. I need, yes, I need a repetition. I need you to turn to me and speak to me. I hate the idea of having an espresso bar that's too quiet where people just assume that you heard this or you heard that. I need to have verification. And that's how you improve consistency. That's how you improve quality of your coffee. You catch mistakes. Maybe there's a batch of espressos that you made for a string of drinks and somebody well-meaning as they are come from the POS once the line dies down and they start putting shots into cups so that we can finish these drinks. Man, I'm going to help you. Now, if you're dedicated to communication, you could tell them, oh, oh, one of those shots this one here is decaf, <laughs> or this one here is not a good one, and I forgot to throw it away. From personal experience, if you forget that and you let that person take that drink too far down the line, now, now we're you know backing up the flow. So we need to have constant communication, and this helps our quality, that helps our consistency and excellence and accuracy. It's just so important, and it's something that's a cultural 
piece of your coffee bar. You have to make this something that you emphasize to people and you practice. If you're the manager, if you're the, the owner and you're working the bar, you practice this. You let them know, hey, when this happens, talk and demonstrate it, that you've got it. And you repeat the drink back to the person who gave it to you. And you say, yes, I understand. You tell the customer that this is the drink and the detail what the drink is. Without communication, we can't expect our quality to be very good. And behind the bar, it's really chaotic. But when we are communicating, we get a sense of grounding for where we are in the process. And we save time by avoiding mistakes. And the avoidance of those mistakes gives us higher quality in the end. So all of these things are among a lot of different areas, I guess we could talk about and how to improve quality. There's a lot of, you know, just practical stuff on the bar that is very granular, adjusting this or that, or, you know, behaviors that will allow you to gain quality. But these are some of the main things that I think you could use in your coffee bar to improve quality almost immediately. If you start doing these, don't wait until you think you can do them perfectly. Just get started. Start paying attention to the ideal age of your coffees. Then the tracking of the performance of those coffees, how customers respond to them and how they're being made across your cafes or just your cafe. You definitely want to have continued education and training for the consistency of your beverages. Don't have any favorite baristas. Let's be excellent as a team and invest in the long-term professional development of your team. Taste all of your beverages. Be a student of your menu the way people do with coffee cupping. And then finally, like we just said, cleanliness and communication is a huge, huge factor here. So I hope that this was helpful for you. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback about today's episode, please do email me, chris at keys to the shop.com. If you are interested in working one-on-one -on -one with me, maybe it's to improve your coffee quality or your hospitality, your operations, your people, leadership. I work one-on-one -on -one with people with coaching and consulting through keys to the shop consulting. You can reach out chris at keys to the shop.com. And I have to let you know, of course, coming up is coffee fest. Now talk about a place where you can really see great improvement in your operations. For the past 30 years, coffee fest has been putting on this trade show with free or accessibly priced trainings, workshops, lectures, panel discussions, all focused on an incredible spectrum of relevant topics to running a great coffee bar. I'm one of those speakers that gets to go every coffee fest. This year, we are going to be next in Louisville, here in my hometown, Louisville, Kentucky. And then there's Anaheim, California, followed by Orlando, Florida. You can use the code KEYS, K-E-Y-S, to get 50% off general admission to the show. So that is just for a general admission. Use the code K-E-Y-S and get yourself and your team signed up when you go to coffeefest.com. I really think this is the best place to go if you're looking to develop yourself, your team, your operations in retail coffee. Check them out over at coffeefest.com. And with that, that is the end of today's show, everyone. I hope that this was useful for you and inspired you. And as always, I'm super excited to have you along listening to the show. Thank you so much for the support. Don't forget to subscribe to the show. Follow the show on Instagram. Share these episodes with your friends, your teammates, your grandparents. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop.